The devil doesn't mind if we're a singing church. We are a good singing church. He doesn't mind if we're a testifying church. Everybody's got a word they want to say. He doesn't even mind too much if we're a preaching church or a teaching church. The devil doesn't mind us getting together on Sunday morning and acting all important and dignified and then going back home saying, man, wasn't a service great today? Wasn't the ser- sermon motivational? Didn't the musicians do it? A nice job. The devil doesn't mind you driving down the road listening to the Sunday worship CD and praising the Lord. He just doesn't want you to take over. He doesn't want you to rise up in power. He doesn't want you to overcome. But I believe that it's time that we as God's church serve notice on the devil that there's a new generation of believers rising up who aren't going to be satisfied with what grandma and grandpa had. We're not going to be satisfied with what mama and daddy had. We're not going to be satisfied just hearing the knocking. We're not going to be satisfied just going to the door. We're not going to be satisfied just hearing God's voice. But we're going to open that door and we're going to let it in. that his death sentence wasn't an idle threat. This was real, and it was going to happen. There are situations that we are forced to deal with, situations that are beyond our control, that is thrust upon us. And they're real. They are a make-or-break situation. They are sometimes a life-or-death situation, and they're real. Herod said, I've already put James to death, and Peter, you're next. But Peter wasn't worried. Because there he was. He was stretched out, his arms behind his head, a little drool dripping from the corner of his mouth. And he was fast asleep. Now pay attention to this. Peter wasn't reading his Bible. He wasn't praying. He wasn't crying his eyes out and pleading his case before God. He wasn't talking to his lawyer, writing a letter to the governor, asking for a pardon. But Peter was asleep. There's some really good theology there if you can wrap your mind around it. When you are the object of attack, it's the prayers of God's church that will sustain you. When you are the target, when you are the one in the crosshairs, it's the faithful prayers of the family of God that will sustain you. When you are the hunted, when you are the prey, it's the prayers of the church that will pick you up and fill you up and strengthen you and encourage you and then head you in so you're safe from the enemy. But the church can't pray for you if the church doesn't know what's going on with you. Sometimes you can't pray. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You can't pray. Sometimes you're too tired and you're too worn to pray. Sometimes you're too exhausted to pray. You try to pray, you want to pray, but your body and your spirit is so worn that you can't keep your mind on what you're trying to do. Even though your spirit is in warfare, your body is still mortal and it's prone to wear. You're, physically, you can only take so much. Emotionally, you can uh, only handle so much. Your mind can only take so much. But if you have the church, somebody listen to what I'm saying here. If you have the church, and the church is praying for you, the devil knows that you're going to get some sleep tonight, but he isn't going to get any. There ought to be some shouting out there right now. You're going to get sleep, but the devil isn't going to get any. When you're in a crisis, the one thing that the devil wants to take away from you is prayer. Because the devil can't handle prayer. Satan understands that through prayer we can resist him, and through prayer we can bind him, and through prayer we can keep him away. The devil understands that prayer is your divine connection with God, and it's a private line. When you start praying, the devil doesn't know what you're up to. When you start praying, he starts sweating because he knows that God is listening to you and he has no idea how God's going to respond. When you start praying, the devil understands that he's no longer in control of your situation. His free reign is over because the mighty Holy Spirit, the Comforter, is being invited to take over. That's why the devil doesn't want you to pray. The devil also wants to take the Bible out of your hands. The Bible is the living Word of God and it's powerful. God doesn't have to physically step in and do things. He's so powerful that all he has to do is say the word. The devil knows that God said, let there be light, and there was light. He knows that God said, let the waters above the earth separate from the waters that are below, and there was no argument or debate, but it happened just exactly as God's word commanded. The devil understands that if you start reading God's word and you start consuming God's word, that God's word will then infill you until there's no longer any room for the lies that he's been telling you. 
He knows that when you ingest God's Word, there'll be no longer any room for you. If you have negative thoughts that He's been putting in your mind, there'll no longer be room for worry. There'll no longer be room for anger. There'll no longer be room for depression because God's Word is the Word of life, and it will speak life into you. And when God's life enters you, the darkness has to flee. That's why the devil wants to keep you away from God's Word. The devil wants you to stop praying, and he wants you to stop reading God's Word, but there's one more thing that he wants to get you away from. The devil wants to get you away from God's church. The church isn't a building. The church isn't an organization, but the church is an organism. The church is alive, and it's living and breathing. It's the bride of the King of Kings. Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me in Acts chapter 2. He said, and I'm giving that power to you, my church. That's why the devil doesn't want you here. That's why he doesn't want you around other believers, and that's why in your time of crisis he wants you to flee from the church. He wants you to find fault with the people that are there. He wants you to hate the sermons that are preached. He wants to point out to you every hypocrite that comes through the door and give you every excuse you need to justify staying away because the devil knows that as long as you're here, he can't get to you. I don't know how you make it without the prayers of the church. I don't know how you get through it. I don't know how you deal with your problems without losing your mind. I don't know how you survive without the prayers of the family of God because when you are the object of attack, you need somebody else on their knees lifting you up before the throne so you can rest in what you already know. And you can say, Lord, if you want me to go through this thing, then I'll go through it. And if you want to deliver me from it, then deliver me from it. But if this is the way it's going to be, then I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to put my life in your hands, and I'm going to go to bed because I need some sleep. The executioner might wake me up in the morning, but I'm going to sleep tonight. That is practical faith. Verse 6 tells us that Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Get a picture of this. Peter was bound with chains. He was locked inside the inner prison, guarded by 16 soldiers and flanked by two armed men. The devil always overdoes it because he fears the power and potential of the child of God. There were enemies on the outside and enemies on the inside, and Peter was bound with personal chains. Peter was troubled on every side. Everywhere he looked, there were people that wanted to keep him where he was. He even had a guard on each side of him that rubbed up against him. Peter couldn't move without touching the enemy. But what did Peter do? Peter went to sleep. That's practical faith. Now, you have to understand something about the character of Peter. Peter was not perfect. Peter was far from perfect, but Peter knew uh, that he was saved. He wasn't perfect, but he knew that he was a child of God. That's the wonderful thing about the Bible. The Bible isn't politically correct. If the Bible would have been written according to these holier-than-thou principles of some people today, there wouldn't be much in the book. But the Bible isn't like that. The Bible is practical. The Word of God speaks to you and me where we live. And God speaks to us through the characters who are just like us, full of warts and blemishes and bad egos and big, bad tempers and big mouths and tight pocketbooks. Peter had a temper which was only superseded on occasion by his big mouth. It was sometimes speak before his brain was in gear. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter snapped and he took out his sword and he cut off another man's ear. Now, most preachers would get fired for that. But Jesus just picked the man's ear up. And he healed him, and then he turned to Peter and he said something like, Peter, I sure wish you'd stop doing dumb things like that. I'm paraphrasing here. (laughs) It was Peter, after Judas betrayed Christ, who went out and betrayed Jesus himself three times on the same night. If Jesus would have used the three-strike method that some people use, Peter would have been out of the ministry. But Jesus restored Peter, and he put him into the pulpit because Romans 11, 29 says, the calling and election of God is without repentance. God is a God of forgiveness and restoration full of love and mercy and slow to anger. Peter was not perfect. Peter was no different than you and me, but Peter could preach. Peter was a premier preacher, and he he was the leader of the church. It was Peter, not Paul, who God used to establish the New Testament church. Paul might have written the books, but it was Peter that did the preaching. Peter was the founder of the New Testament church. Paul wasn't there on the day of Pentecost. That was Peter. Paul wasn't uh, there when the 3,000 were saved. That was Peter. 
Peter with the big mouth, Peter with the bad temper, Peter would deny Jesus three times, was the man that God chose to lead his church. Are you still with me here? Be careful of the people that you choose to throw away. Peter preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Anyone, sinners and saints alike, has the ability to recognize when somebody's preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. But Peter, who had backslidden, Peter, who had betrayed Christ, repented of his sin, and Jesus said to him, Peter, feed my sheep. sheep. Peter, finish your ministry. Some people think that Jesus put Peter back into the ministry, but that's not what happened. Jesus didn't put Peter back into the ministry because Jesus had never taken Peter out of the ministry. Because the calling and election of God is without repentance. Or as the NIV puts it, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. That means that if God's called you, if he has commissioned you, and he's anointed you, even though you've sinned and even though you've stumbled, God hasn't pulled his anointing from you. But God, who knows all things already, knew that you were going to betray him before he ever called you in the first place, but he called you anyway. Be careful when you criticize those who God has chosen to speak for him. Be careful when you attack God's anointed because he's warned in 1 Chronicles 16, 22, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. What if Peter would have never gone back into the ministry? What if, what if Peter, ridden by guilt, would have just gone back to being a fisherman? What, what if the church would have decided that Peter had denied Christ and he wasn't longer, uh, no longer qualified to be their pastor? Thank God Peter understood that the blood of Jesus covers all sin. It was one thing for Herod to kill James, but when he talked about killing Peter, it cut the church to the core because Peter was the covering for the church. Listen to this. Peter was their pastor. Peter was their leader. He was the one who fed them the word of God and taught them the ways of God. But now the table was turned and the church had to cover for Peter. I thank God often for this church because Free Christian is that kind of a church. When me and my family have had to endure a crisis, this congregation has always been there for us, to support us, to cover us, so we were able to sleep through the night and rise to preach the gospel in the morning. Peter's congregation understood that when Peter was in trouble, they were in trouble. They understood the fragility of the structure of the local church. But not everybody gets that. The church of God will always stand. The Bible says so. The gates of hell can't prevail against God's church. But the local assembly of believers is just the reflection of God's true church to this world. The local church, this this church is a copy of the reality. It's a copy of the original Just like the tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness was a copy of the original that God had shown him in heaven, so this local church is a copy of God's original that was erected on the day of Pentecost. Even though a local church might be large and successful and employ several ministries, it's still fragile. Peter's church understood that. They understood that Peter was the primary target because Peter was God's anointed to pastor their church. Peter's church understood the structure, so they didn't do what some churches do. They didn't get down on Peter. They didn't say, you know, if he was a real man of God, he wouldn't be in all this trouble. If he was a real man of God, he wouldn't be in jail. If Peter lived what he preached, he wouldn't be in all of this mess. They didn't say that. Thank God they didn't say that. Church, there are anointed men and women out there who are bound and who need to be set free, but sometimes we help keep them prisoner when we refuse to be the church. Pray for your pastors. Understand the structure of the church. Understand how fragile it is and pray for your pastors by name. Don't just speak some poetry to God and ask for some generic blessing. Don't just say, well, God, bless the sermon and bless the music and bless the offering, but put on your holy armor, pick up your shield of faith and grab a hold of your sword of the Spirit and get down on your knees and fight the fight of faith. Bind the enemy and build the hedge and break the chains and open the prison doors and pray the power of the living God down from heaven. While Peter was going through his trial, the church was fighting his fight. We know that their warfare was effective. We know that their prayers were successful because Peter was able to go to sleep. Anytime you can sleep through a trial, it's because somebody's praying for you. Anytime you can doze off while you're facing the threat of death, it's because somebody's praying for you. 
Anytime you can lay your troubles aside and relax enough to go to bed and rest, it's because somebody is praying for you. Anytime you can have this unnatural grace during a stressful situation, it's because somebody who loves you is standing in the gap for you in prayer. Sometimes you can't pray for yourself. Sometimes you need somebody else lifting up your name before the throne of God and throwing up a shield in front of you and wielding a sword around you. Sometimes you need, you need somebody else to build your hedge. Sometimes you need somebody on their knees specifically calling your name out before God. Saying to God, Pastor Jim is going through a terrible time. He's going through a crisis, and I pray the blood over his situation. I pray the blood over his children. I pray the blood over his wife. I pray the blood over his finances and over his job. There are times when you need somebody specifically calling out your name, fighting your fight, taking on your enemies so you can go to bed in sleep. Instead of kneeling at the altar and asking God for what you want, have you ever thought about kneeling down and praying for the needs of the person sitting next to you? That's what the church was doing. But I want you to notice something. While they were praying in one part of the city, God was answering their prayers on the other side of town. You might not always see what's happening. You may not be feeling anything. You might not be getting a sign. You might not be hearing a word or be getting goosebumps. You might think that God isn't listening. You might think that, that what you said to God on your knees has bounced off the ceiling and dropped back into your lap, but I'm telling you, don't you dare quit. Because while you are in one part of town wondering whether God is even listening to you, he has dispatched angels to the other side of town who are opening gates and breaking chains and doing everything that you've asked God to do. God didn't announce, I'm working it all out. Nobody got a chill. Nobody saw a sign or had a vision. So here's the scenario. One group of people, the church, are on their knees on one side of town, and they're seeing no evidence of any move of God, while Peter is sleeping on the other side of town because they're praying. God is working where Peter is, while those who have been praying for him are totally oblivious to the move of God. Don't ever stop praying. Don't ever get off your knees. Don't get depressed or discouraged because you don't see anything happening where you are because it just might be possible that from the very moment, the very first word that you uttered to God in prayer, he put his angels on the job. It's possible that the one that you've been praying for, the one who need, needs to get saved, the one that you, you're about to give up on is being wooed by the Holy Ghost and you don't know anything about it. It's possible that the one that you've been praying for to be healed, who day in and day out has shown no sign of recovery, is being attended to by a room full of angels, and you're not even aware of it. It's possible that the job that you've been worrying about and the finances you've been worrying about and the bills that have been keeping you up at night are about to be conquered because God is getting ready to pour out on you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You just don't see it coming. You never know how prayer will affect a situation. Just because you don't see anything or hear anything or feel anything doesn't mean that God isn't working on your behalf because practical faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that you can't see. God is up to something. Even when it looks like he isn't doing anything, he's up to something. When you can't feel him and you can't see him, he's still up to something. When you don't understand what he's doing, he's still up to something. James says, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God doesn't have to send you a memo. He doesn't have to update you on the progress. He's already sent his answer. His angels are on the run, and you don't have to have goosebumps or feel a feeling or have a sign for God to be on your case because he is always active in your life. Never give up on him because he hasn't given up on you. Verse 7 says, suddenly... Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. It was dark in Peter's prison. But in the middle of all of this utter darkness, in a place where there were no windows, in a dungeon where there were no lamps to illuminate, in a place where the damp stench of dying prisoners filled the air, God sent a light. It doesn't matter how dark your situation might be. Satan might have you locked away and buried deep, and he's convinced you that the sun is never going to shine again. He may have you bound hand and foot, and you're unable to move without touching the enemy. The powers that be might have condemned you to die in the morning, but I'm here to tell you that God is sending a light into your darkness, and he's about to show you the way out. The angel said, Peter, get up quickly. When God tells you to move, you move. 
You don't try to figure it out. You don't question his judgment. You don't critique his counsel. You just get up and move. When Peter got up, his chains fell off. Are you paying attention here? When Peter acted in obedience to what God was telling him to do, and he stood up, then his chains fell off. Some of you are still bound in shackles because when God told you to move, you didn't move. You didn't have enough faith to suck it up and stand up, and the window of opportunity has passed you by. The chains on you won't come off of you until you stand up. The bonds that hold you won't be broken until you make a bold move. You can't be free until you stop stewing in your circumstances and laying around in your own personal pity party, whining about what's wrong and worrying about what hasn't even happened yet and fretting over things that you might never ever have to face. Do you hear what I'm telling you? The devil might be plotting your demise in the morning, but God is planning a jailbreak for you tonight. Get up and walk to the light. The angel said, Peter, gird yourself and strap on your shoes and cast your coat around your shoulders. He's telling Peter to get ready. The Holy Spirit didn't come to your prison to just do prison ministry. He came to set you free. So you got to get ready to be free. Gird yourself, tie on your shoes, put on your coat, because God is about to set you completely free. The Bible says that they passed through the first and second ward, and then they came to the iron gate, which the Bible says opened by itself. Now I think what that means is no, no man had to open that gate. God opened the iron gate because God knows that it's still prison until you go all the way. People might be able to help you get so far, but only God can get you all the way out. Some people come to God and all they want is a little religion. They want just enough to get by. Women want their husbands saved, but only enough so he'll scratch your back and take out the trash. Men want their wife to be saved, but only enough that she'll cook him supper and give him back the remote control. Some people want to be saved just enough to get them out of their chains, but you ain't free until you've left the prison. Some people want out of the first war. They want to get out of trouble. They want God to get them out of their debt. They want him to heal their sickness or to clean up their mess, but that's all the further they want to go. Some even go as far as the one out of the second war. They'll start going to church occasionally, and they'll clean up their life a little bit. But I'll tell you, you ain't free until you get all the way out. The devil... Has, still has control over you. He can still reach you. He can still rechain you, and he can still execute you unless you get completely out. You have to go all the way. It's all or nothing. Meanwhile, back at the church, while this was all going on at the jailhouse, the church was still praying. The church was still praying. I, I picture this in my mind because we do this a lot. We have prayer requests. Wednesday night, family night, we get our prayer requests, and we get the list of things. So, okay, we'll get a prayer list. And nobody, the phone never rings while we're praying to tell us that God's answer to prayer. Nobody comes running in from the parking lot, go, guess what just happened? I know what that's like. The church was still praying, and in the midst of their praying, there came a knock at the door. There was a knock at the door, but none of the preachers, none of the elders, none of the trustees, None of the mission board members, none of the Sunday school teachers got up to answer it. I'm not criticizing. They were praying. They were doing the right thing. They just weren't expecting anything. Who's feeling convicted now? <laughs> but there was a young girl by the name of Rhoda, and she heard the knocking, so she got up. When you have the spirit of Rhoda, you can hear. Everybody else might be having church as usual, but you can hear something that nobody else is hearing. There's something happening inside of you. You can't explain it. You can't articulate it. But the Spirit of God is knocking, and you can hear it. But you've heard something that nobody else has heard. And now you have to go against the status quo. You have to interrupt the service and do something because you've heard something that other people haven't heard. And you have to make up your mind, do I want to fit in and keep acting like I can't hear? Or am I willing to be controversial and step away from the crowd and say, y'all keep doing what you're doing? but I'm going to the door because I hear something. We need the spirit of Rhoda in the church. Rhoda was moved to action. She had faith enough to hear the knocking at the door, but she also had faith enough to get up and go to the door. Christian, it's not enough for you to sit here on Sunday morning, Sunday in and Sunday out, and hear the word of God preached, but you have to get up and walk out of this place and do something about what you've heard. She went to the door and she said, Who is it? And she heard the voice of Peter. She recognized 
Peter's voice. She had enough relationship with the man of God to know his voice. You can't serve somebody if you don't know their voice. You ought to know when it sounds like the pastor and when it doesn't. Somebody might say, I heard that your preacher said this, but you ought to know whether or not it sounds like him. She recognized his voice. There ought to be something distinctive about the man of God so that you can discern his voice from the voices of others so that when you hear it, you know it in your spirit. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. She went back to the prayer meeting, and she told the others, Peter's at the door, and the thing that you've been praying about is right out here at the door. Christian, that's why all hell is breaking loose in this world. That's why the devil's on a rampage and demons are at work, because the thing that you've been praying about is at the door. The thing that you've been praying about is at the door. There isn't a Sunday morning that goes by that I'm laying in bed before the alarm goes off, and I'm praying for that one great Sunday when everything just opens up. Every Sunday I pray, God, today, make today the day. Make the day the day. Church, we are this close. We're this close. You see, the problem that Rhoda had is the same problem a lot of people in church have. She'd been waiting for so long and praying for so long that when the answer to her prayer came to the door, she had faith enough to hear the knocking. She had faith enough to get up from where she was and go to the door. She had faith enough to ask the right questions, but then she got so excited about being that close to it, she didn't open the door and let it in. Church, we are that close. We are that close. What we've been praying for, the miracle, the revival, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is right outside of the door, and we need to get up and let it in. We can't just sit in the pew and yell, it's unlocked, come on in. God is too much of a gentleman to do that. He's a special guest. He's an honored guest, and we need to get up and let him in and greet him like Mary did. We need to hug him until we can't hug him anymore. We need to wash his feet with our tears and pour out our very vest on his feet. God has set a door before you, and it's time to open it. You see, the church has been stuck with the spirit of Rhoda for a long, long time. We've taught and we've preached and we've prayed about change and transformation. We've sung about it and testified about it and we've shouted about it, but we've never opened the door and let it in. we got all the bells and whistles. We've got everything we think that we need, but we haven't opened the door and let it in. The devil doesn't mind if we're a singing church. We are a good singing church. He doesn't mind if we're a testifying church. Everybody's got a word they want to say. He doesn't even mind too much if we're a preaching church or a teaching church. The devil doesn't mind us getting together on Sunday morning and acting all important and dignified and then going back home saying, man, wasn't a service great today? Wasn't the ser- sermon motivational? Didn't the musicians do it? a nice job? The devil doesn't mind you driving down the road listening to the Sunday worship CD and praising the Lord. He just doesn't want you to take over. He doesn't want you to rise up in power. He doesn't want you to overcome. But I believe that it's time that we as God's church serve notice on the devil that there's a new generation of believers rising up who aren't going to be satisfied with what grandma and grandpa had. We're not going to be satisfied with what mama and daddy had. We're not going to be satisfied just hearing the knocking. We're not going to be satisfied just going to the door. We're not going to be satisfied just hearing God's voice. But we're going to open that door and we're going to let it in. We're not going to go back to our seat without getting what we have prayed for. We're not going to give up and be satisfied just being close. But if it's the last thing we ever do, we're going to open the door and we're going to let it in.